Hello everyone. Today I'm going to record a tutorial about how to use two really valuable online resources for researching enslaved people in the British Caribbean. So the first is a database called Legacies of British Slave Ownership, and the second is the slave registers, those censuses that we've talked about that were taken in the British Caribbean between uh, the 18 teens and the 1830s. So I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see these databases and I'll walk you through how to use um, these these resources. So the first one is Legacies of British Slave Ownership. This is something that's free, available to the public. You don't need to have Harvard ID to use this database. It's run out of University College London um, with the support of the Hutchins Center at Harvard. Uh, and there are a lot of different ways to use this. You can search, you can browse. For example, you can browse maps of different colonies. So if you look at Jamaica, you know, we've talked about the Vassal family those Harvard graduates, the vassals, and we know that their plantations were in Hanover Parish, which is way over here in the western part of Jamaica. So if you zoom way, way in on this map, you can see Green River and Newfound River. Those are the plantations owned by William and John Oliver, two Harvard grads. So if you click on it, you can see estate details and it'll give you a lot of information about, um, about those estates. But the map is only really helpful if you know exactly where the plantation is, and you don't always know that. So there are other ways to search this database. You can click on search the database. Another person that we've talked a lot about is Thomas Oliver, who is uh, the guy who built Elmwood, the Harvard president's house. And we know that he had a sugar plantation in Antigua. So I'm gonna put in Oliver, I'm gonna put in Antigua, and let's see what it gives us. We do that. Those records. Okay. Huh. So it didn't return Thomas Oliver to us, but it did show us three women whose maiden names are all Oliver. And if you look here, it says Friars Hill. I don't know if you remember, we've done some research about Thomas Oliver, and Friars Hill is the name of his plantation. And the reason it's showing us his daughters and not him is that he died in 1815, and these registers started in 1817. So they're, they're his heirs who are listed there. And what we're looking at here it says claim detail and a date in the 1830s. So what happened was when the United Kingdom uh, emancipated enslaved people in the Caribbean, it compensated slave owners, paying them for the loss of enslaved people. So Thomas Oliver's heirs filed a claim with the British government, and they were paid almost 2,000 pounds for the 137 enslaved people living on Friars Hill in the 1830s. In modern terms, that's about a quarter of a million pounds. So it's a really substantial amount of money. And the British government actually just finished paying off this debt um, that it, it borrowed to repay slave owners. It just finished paying it off within the last five to 10 years. So that was a huge amount of money paid to slave owners by the British government. If you look through you'll see it lists Friars Hill. I'm gonna click on that, see if it has more information about the estate for us. Uh, these are the names of his children who, who benefited. Okay, so, all right. So we see here in 1815, the owner was Thomas Oliver, which we knew. Um, and here's the claim. Oh, okay, and here we get some estate information. These are the years of those registers, taken every three or four years. Um, and so we can see that in 1817, there were 206 enslaved people at Friars Hill. There's a note here um, that's a, a citation, and this is a call number referring to the file in the British National Archives where this information came from. Unfortunately, this database does not connect directly to that primary source. You can't just click on this and have it pop up the census, which is really unfortunate. It, I wish it did that. Um, but there is a workaround, and so I'm gonna teach you that workaround, which is not simple, but I hope I can teach it to you in a few easy steps. So the tool that we need to make this work is ancestry.com. 
which you may have used for, for other um, for family history or other projects. If you go to Hollis and type in Ancestry, you'll get Ancestry Library Edition. Ancestry Library Edition is the really powerful version of Ancestry.com that includes records from many different countries, not just US records. So we're going to click on New Collections and type in slave registers. Oops, and it would help if I actually spelled registers correctly. There you go. Okay, so these are the slave registers from 1813 to 1834. Great. I'm going to turn this to Antigua and click on 1817 because that's what we were looking at. And it has decided to go back. Sorry, bear with me. Try that again. Okay. Antigua. Yes, that's what I wanted. Antigua in 1817. Okay. So this brings you to a scan of the actual primary document of the Antigua Slave Register for 1817 in the British National Archives. I'm going to skip ahead here and just look at the call number, make sure I'm looking at the right thing. T71244. Is that right? Yep, T71244. And this gives us a page number, 302 to 307. Now if I actually type in 302 here, that doesn't actually go quite far enough because there um, are all of those pages at the beginning that have numbers. So this only brings us to 253. So I need to skip ahead a little bit to 353. And here's where we have the actual census for Friars Hill. So it says Samuel Warner, attorney for the estate of Friars Hill, belonging to the heirs of Thomas Oliver, deceased. Okay, this is the right one. What you'll see here is a list of the 206 enslaved people living at Friars Hill in 1817. It lists them by name, sex, color, and age. And it's actually several pages long because there are so many people. It lists men first. It actually, it's, it's by sex and color. So it actually lists black men first and black women second. And then after black men and black women, um, it begins with a section called colored. Um, so people who are of mixed race. And the people who, uh, the, who are designated as colored instead of black actually tend to have um, last names more frequently. And as you know, in any genealogical research, if you have a first name and a last name, that might make it easier to, to trace people. So if you're looking for descendants, that's a, at least a place to start uh, where people have last names listed here. And you'll see at the bottom, total 206 slaves signed by Samuel Warner in 1817. So that's one way to use this ancestry database to sort of get some of the details that are not listed in the legacies of British slave ownership. But you can use legacies of British slave ownership in different ways. So we did search the database to find the Olivers. We can also search the estates, right? Before we were talking about William Vassal in Jamaica, and we know that his plantation was called Green River. So if you say, we want to see Green River in Jamaica, we know that's Hanover Parish, and find it. And look, here it is, Green River. We'll click on that. This database actually has a lot of information about Green River and actually more than it had about Friars Hill. So if you look here, these records start in 1740. And if you look at the citation, these are from the Jamaica archives. So if you go to Jamaica and you look in their national archives, they have a lot more records about Green River, about what was being produced there all through the whole 18th century when William Vassal, the Harvard grad, owned that plantation. So you can see sugar, rum, molasses, mahogany. So producing wood for expensive furniture uh, on this plantation. And let's sort of keep going down to where the slave registers are in the 1800s. All right, so here we go. Um, 1817, so this is interesting. In the first census, there are 157 people listed. Um, but then in the next census at Green River, 
it says uh, 64 enslaved people previously registered on Rockingham Estate were sold to William Vassal. So even in 1820, William Vassal is still, this is now William Vassal Jr., who is also a Harvard grad, um, is still expanding his plantation. Even after the transatlantic slave trade has been banned by the British government, he's still purchasing more people from other Jamaican sugar planters. So that you see by the time we get up to the 1820s, now there are now 248, 304, there are lots of people. This is a huge plantation. And let's look at one of their, one of their registers. So, okay, let's look at their 1817. So T71, 190. We go back to Ancestry. We don't wanna look at Antigua anymore. We wanna look at Jamaica. And we know it's Hanover Parish. And we wanna look at the 1817 register. What page is it? Page 705 to 709, okay? So that's probably pretty, pretty far into this. Let's try 770, see where that gets us. Um, Oh, 709. Okay, actually, that was pretty close. Let's see, we're looking for page 705. Oh, that says 7, does that say 714? Sorry. Looking for 705. So it says 708. 707, okay, sorry. 705. Let's see here if this is the right one. Okay, so there's a, a record above it and we find here the beginning of Green River Sugar Estate. Okay, and we see John Blythe, the attorney for William Vassal, the proprietor. Okay, this is exactly what we're looking for. This is Green River Estate um, owned by William Vassal, the Harvard grad. Actually, at this point, this is William Vassal Jr was also a Harvard grad. Um, and you'll see that this register actually contains a little bit more information than the Antigua register. It includes, oh, this is, sorry. It includes the, um, the names of people and also whether they were African or Creole. So whether they were born in Africa or born in Jamaica. And then many of the people Next to, next to their names, especially the Creole people, it'll list a woman's name. And so this is the, mother, the mother's name. So um, Clorinda, who's 17 and is a Creole, her mother's name is Betsy. That's really valuable if you're doing genealogical research and you're trying to find family connections or descendants. If you have um, a child's name and a parent's name, and uh, an approximate birth date, right? Because you can, if she's 17, it's 1817, she's born about 1800. So that's a really valuable tool if you're looking for descendants of people who were owned by the Vassal family. Now, the slave registers are not the easiest thing to use. And if you're doing a project where you want to use these slave registers, please reach out to me and I'll help you get through them and, and, and search through them because they're really not the easiest records to use. You know, one of the things about them is if you look here at, at the Ancestry search page, they really make it really hard for you to search by slave owner's name. So there's no place in here where you can just type in William Vassal or Thomas Oliver. Like sometimes the keyword thing helps, but not really. Like if you, if you type in, William Vassal, you know, you, you, you sometimes do get them, but sometimes you don't. Um, it's hard to use. If you're trying to use it, please do tell me and I will try to help you with this. So that's Legacies of British Slave Ownership and the, um, and the slave registers. Please let me know if you have any questions and thanks very much.